I'm tempted to start the first post-Trump diatribe with the words, we made it. Right? But then I'm reminded of how many of us didn't make it, and it just seems braggy. But don't get me wrong. By all means, raise your glasses, pop your corks, light your spliffs, whatever it is you do to celebrate, you've earned it. The entire world is better off today than it was on Tuesday. It calls for the kind of celebration you'd normally reserve for an armistice. But when we sober up from all our reverie, our well-earned reverie, let's not make the mistake of confusing Trump's loss for our win. I mean, sure, it was great listening to a president speak in complete sentences again during that inaugural speech, but an awful lot of them sentences were about his magical sky buddy. You know, the, the, the fact that he didn't even notice the irony in saying, unity, 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 I want to bring us all together. Now, everyone, please join me in my religion, says an awful lot about where we rank on the national priorities list. Before I go any further, let me let me be super clear on what I'm not saying here, okay? I am not saying that Biden won't be an astronomical improvement over the dictatorial man baby we just ousted. Okay, I mean, he's obviously going to be significantly better on social justice issues, environmental issues, economic issues, public health issues, and literally every other category of issues known or otherwise. Right. But 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 even if you just judge him on that very narrow range of religious issues, I think it's safe to say the Biden administration, you know, isn't going to expand the Christian right to discriminate. He's probably not going to push for laws that funnel more tax dollars to churches. He's probably not going to nominate batshit Christian dominionists to the highest echelons of the federal government. In fact, the Biden administration will probably rescind some of the newfound bonus rights that evangelicals earned under Trump. Maybe not all of them. I mean, he's not going to undo the Supreme Court cases that were decided by Trump's band of political law hacks. And, and as much as we'd love to see him expand the court, I don't think there's any indication that that's even on the menu at this point. And, and, and that's just one level of it. Like Even in the executive branch, I doubt he's going to roll back all of the bones that Trump threw to the evangelicals. I mean, will he, for example, change the FEMA policy that allows disaster funds to be used to rebuild churches? I mean, the Constitution sure would have him do that, but will a centrist Democrat who's already being sold as an enemy of the church and who's part of that semi-pagan Catholic faith anyway spend political capital writing that particular wrong? And even if the answer is yes, he's going to face basically that same question in a thousand different ways. Is he going to say yes all thousand times? I, I mean, consider this problem from the ground up. So bigots wanted a legal way to discriminate against LGBTQ people, and they found it in religion. But to sell their fight to the masses, they couldn't frame it as a fight against LGBTQ rights. They had to frame it as a fight for religious rights. So they passed a bunch of laws where sincerely held beliefs trigger some special exemption to the law. RIFRA laws are the most prominent examples, but there are a bunch of different ways that this strategy has been employed by federal and state legislatures. OK, so imagine that you're tasked with fixing that problem in the most politically expedient way possible. Repealing laws and policies that were marketed as bills about religious freedom with grandiose titles to match is certainly one way to go about it. But if you're only half paying attention, which is more than you can say for most of America, it looks bad, right? You're repealing religious freedom laws. I mean, at the very least, it requires that you explain that the law was never actually about religious freedom in the first place. And no matter how much you whittle down that argument, it still leaves you at the mercy of the American attention span. But there's another way to go about it. You know, you could just call them on their bluff. They've been saying the whole time that it wasn't really about bigotry. It was about freedom. So you can always just go out there and say, well, if it was never about discriminating against LGBTQ people, I'm sure you won't mind if we amend the law to add the words just so long as it doesn't interfere with the rights of LGBTQ people. Right. And, you know, they'll probably fight that. But you've put them on the defensive and now they're the ones trying to explain the nuances of their position to the masses. And on top of that, their position is morally reprehensible. So you could see why that would be a damn tempting alternative, right? Leave the new law in place, but add protections to it. Problem with that is that the net that they threw was always way wider than the group they were trying to catch. It had to be for them to have any plausible deniability about the goals of the law to begin with, right? So if, for example, you pass a law that says landlords have the right to refuse rent to people whose lifestyles conflict with their sincerely held religious beliefs... Adding protection for LGBTQ people only solves part of the problem. 
It might be the part of the law that they were going for in the first place, but it will still allow for discrimination against, say, unmarried couples or or, or people with tattoos or, or, or people who wear mixed fabrics. Anybody the religious people don't want to rent to, really. And look, this is just one example of how even a well-intentioned effort to rebuild what Trump tore down could fall short. The evangelicals had their little shadow government working behind the scenes through all of Trump's dumpster fire distractions with Pence and McConnell just steadily eroding any perceived threat to Christian hegemony. It'll take us years just to figure out what all we've lost. And, and, and I don't know how one measures this kind of thing, right? Like how many pounds of rights did we lose? How many gigabytes of freedom or whatever? But the most tempting scale is time. Like, like the rights of secular Americans, our, our freedom from religion, is the worst it's been at any point in my lifetime. So it's tempting to say that we've lost at least 45 years worth of progress. You know, that it would take at least that long just to claw our way back to where we were. Now, the good news is that that's probably not the right way to measure it, right? Because 45 years ago, there wasn't us. There, there weren't people who so vividly remembered a time when religious freedom didn't mean granting extra rights to religious people and people who remember that religion was able to thrive even before we started pumping taxpayer money into their coffers. There, there, there wasn't a robust atheist movement that could draw on so many people across the country to join in their fight 45 years ago. Now, look, I've watched the atheist movement get beat the fuck up over the last few years, often deservedly. I talk to listeners pretty regularly who say they still listen to our show and, and maybe a few other podcasts, but they don't really consider themselves part of the atheist movement anymore. And I honestly, I, I get that. A lot of us turned out to be really shitty people. And there's only so many times you can see that happen before you want to write the group off as a whole. But, but the stakes have been raised too much for that. Right? The right thing to do was never to walk away. It was to push the assholes out. And we've never needed you to do that more. We were left out of Biden's national call for unity. And it's only by uniting ourselves first that we're going to fight our way back in.